All right, so, hey, you can hear me okay. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate this. It's a great conference. And um, uh, I accidentally attended last year's conference. Whatever you did, thank you there. <laughs> uh, last year's conference, I, I, I was, happened to be in Stockholm, and I was walking. Uh, I tried to get tickets because I was in town, and I had the day free, but they were already sold out. And I was walking around. I didn't know where the conference was, and I was walking by that clar uh, clarion sign, is it, there? And, and Richard Campbell, one of the speakers, happened to be outside taking a breath of air. And he said, hey, Woody, he saw me come by and dragged me in. And Marcus got me a ticket, and I spent the rest of the day there. It was wonderful. So I'm so happy to be here today. Uh, I hope you've all been enjoying it. I'm sure you have been. Uh, it's a nice, calm day uh, on a Saturday. It's nice to spend it doing something you enjoy doing. I always start uh, my talks with this slide. I can't tell you what to do or whether or not you should do it. I'm going to be sharing with you some of my own thinking about something that we did at Hunter Industries. I'll explain a little bit about it. And I'll tell you why we did it in some cases or some of my thinking about that. But I can't tell you that you should do it. But hopefully all of you have already heard of mob programming. But before this conference came along, uh, let's see the hands of those who had not yet heard of mob programming. Anybody here not yet heard of it? So not, it's not that big number. Sorry if I'm making you raise your hands there, but I want to get a feeling. Because actually, I think there's more mob programming going on now in Sweden than in a focused manner than anywhere else in the world. You'll see a few slides of that in a bit. And my very first trip to uh, Europe in my life was in 2013. And it was to speak at a conference about mob programming. Happened to be here in Malmo, a different conference. And I went up to Stockholm the week later. It was in October. And I went and spoke at to eight or 10 different companies at a time, including a user group uh, or a kind of a meetup at the Tretz and Tretzi Who. I know I'm not saying that correctly, but there you go. And uh, they had invited me in to speak. And I actually, they gave me a t-shirt to wear. They said, here's, a, here's our t-shirt. And I said, well, I don't have room in my suitcase to put more t-shirts. So I took off my t-shirt and gave it to them and put on their t-shirt. So somebody did, yesterday, Carl, told me they still have that T-shirt at in the offices. So hopefully they've washed it by now. <laughs> but uh, that year, I, I, I could say, hey, I'm not a professional speaker. I, I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm afraid to get in front of a crowd. Now, I don't have that an excuse anymore because I've been now speaking for five or six years at conferences. And I really enjoy doing this. So... Uh, take this to heart, what I just shared with you there, but um, Joshua Kierievsky, I worked with him for a little while, and he told me you need to use a picture of a cat in your, in your slides. So there's a cat. And this uh, demonstrates an interesting thing, and I want to share it with you before we go into the real talk. Uh, I always ask, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a very uh, academic sort, uh, but who here has, uh, knows that they have apophenia? Do you have apophenia? We all have apophenia. Should I say, keep your hands down if you don't, if you, if you have apophenia, keep your hands down. Okay, perfect. Because this is the thing where we will make sense out of any data that we have. We will put nonsense uh, meaning into data that doesn't have that meaning there. So this whole talk I'm sharing with you is my thinking about why could mob programming possibly work. And so... I know that it's worked for us, so this is sort of one of these problems with confirmation bias, where you only accept information that confirms what you already believe, and you reject data that tells you you're wrong. So that's sort of part of what this is about, the human need to get meaning out of meaningless stuff. So we have to be careful, we have to protect ourselves against that. So you all now learned you have apophenia. You can go home and tell your family how poorly you feel. Uh, one last thing I want to say is I don't think that we need to control software development. I think we need to liberate it. And that's been the quest I've been on for almost 20 years. I won't go into any details. I started programming in uh, 1982 or three, I think 1983. And uh, I programmed alone for about 15 years. And then I started working for other people. And that's when I started realizing this is a tough industry to work in. It just didn't seem like Things were set up to make it easy for good work to get done. And that quest of 20 years, starting about 1999 till now, uh, culminated 
in 2011 with us accidentally stumbling upon this idea of mob programming. So what I'm going to tell you about with mob programming a real quick introduction. How many do mob programming? Do you mind raising your hands again? How many actually do mob programming in your work? Six or seven. Well, there's a team worth right there. So in Stockholm, I'm going to be visiting five or six companies next week. At least three of them are already doing, um, with many teams, five, six, seven or more teams, do mob programming uh, on a daily basis all day long. So there are teams around that are doing that. And out of a group of this size, I would hope I would have seen a few more than just uh, a handful. But that's all right. Uh, whether you do it or not, I'm going to explain to you why I think it works. Because you, you're stuck here, right? You can't leave. They lock the doors, I hope. So I'm going to real quickly explain what it is. Because, um, because it's not exactly what most people think it is. I think of it this way. Mob programming is all the brilliant minds working together on the same thing at the same time in the same space. And if you do anything like agile software development, I think this was the basis of agile software development. The idea that if we gather pe the people together that need to do this work and they work on the same thing, then they can collaborate. We get them all in the same space, working on the same thing, at the same time they can collaborate. But it's rare to see five or six people working on a single thing. And the way it really emphasizes that with mob programming is that we're all working at the same computer. It's going to be five or six or 10 or 20, and I've never seen it more than 14, I think, in actual work. Usually from five to six people is sort of typical. There's no magic number for team size. But if we gather together all the the, the knowledge and skills in the people we need to do this specific work, then we can get it done very well. And I'm going to try to explain why I think that works. It looks like this. This is a, half of our original team and a couple others that weren't there when we originally started doing this. I think this picture was taken in 2012. When we started doing this in 2011. And uh, it seems crazy. It seems crazy. So preposterous, the definition, contrary to reason or common sense, utterly superb, uh, excuse me, absurd or ridiculous. So as far as I'm concerned, yeah, this seems ridiculous. But when I was first introduced to pair programming in 1999, I think it was 1999, somebody said, hey, I've been reading about this thing called pair programming. My first response was, I'd like to try that. Because I'd already learned, I was already an older guy by then, I'd already learned by then that if something sounds crazy, then I probably shouldn't say that's ridiculous. I should just try it. Because I had already learned by then I was wrong most of the time. When I threw away the crazy ideas, there's a famous quote about that. Uh, if something doesn't seem crazy, then it's probably not a good idea. So anyways, but I want to make this clear. It's not five people watching one person programming. This is five people working to together to create software. And I like to see it with the... With the uh, tester, a couple programmers maybe, maybe uh, a uh, uh, product expert, a database expert, all the knowledge gathered together sitting at that table at the same time. And this is exactly what was going on here. We have all the knowledge and skills we need to do the work we're doing. In this picture, there's only one person missing, and that's the product owner. And that was a problem at this company, but it still worked out. We want to have everybody there. And the product owner, guess what, is usually the one person that has the knowledge that the rest of the team can't just look up in Google. You have Google here in Sweden? Right? So we looked up stuff in a browser uh, search engine thing. Uh, and yeah, you can't look up what did the product owner mean about, what, is the, what do they mean by this? Google knows they're not going to expose that they know that. And so you can't find it in the search engine, right? Because they've already... They've probably already stored all of our records. Oh, I hope Google isn't watching. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. My whole system will go down shortly. So what it is, we use this thing we call driver navigators. It's a simple mechanism. I won't give it in detail. I, I do share this in my workshops. Uh, and in my longer or in my introductory talk, I explain it a little bit more. But the basic idea is there's somebody at the keyboard, and they're acting as a driver. They're taking care of the immediate actions. And everyone else is considered a navigator, and they're guiding us what's our next step. So the person at the keyboard is always just doing what we explain we want to have done, and they're inputting into the keyboard. And it can be code, but it could also be writing an email. It could be writing a document. Uh, we do, uh, on our team, we would do all of our, I point at my screen here, like, 
you know what that's uh, when when we we take a phone call as a team we answer our emails as a team so we follow this simple guideline and this is what's made it kind of possible for us that I learned from the well on Falco and I highly recommend you get a chance to hear him go hear him uh, I learned this from him, I think, in 2007 or 8. For an idea to go from somebody's head into the computer, it must go through someone else's hands. This was a pair programming technique. It changes the paradigm of how pair programming usually works. Usually, if you're sitting at the computer, you're the one with the idea. And then you kind of get stuck, and then the other person says, oh, I know what to do, and they take the keyboard and they start typing. So uh, this changes that paradigm. When you have the idea, you leave the keyboard and you let somebody else take it. Exactly how that works isn't important. I'm just giving you an introduction. But still, this seems preposterous. But oddly, uh, it worked really well for us. And we started doing it uh, sometime around September or October, I think, of 2011. And uh, within six months, we had a trainer come in to do some training for us. That trainer noticed how we were working as a team, and uh, we were going to learn some technical stuff from this person, and they started telling other people how we were working, and pretty soon we were getting asked to come and talk about it at user groups and conferences and do little workshops. My first workshop I ever did, I believe, was at Ericsson in, uh, in Stockholm uh, in 2013. All righty. So I'm going to show you some pictures real quick. This is uh, where we started, Hunter Industries in San Marcos, California. And it's being done all over the world. Real quickly, Alaska, that's in the US, the UK, Hungary, GDS in London, uh, Zipcar in Boston, TUI uh, in Stockholm, Unruly in London. Uh, at Harvard, they teach some classes using this. Zito is a company in um, San Diego. And uh, I really love their setup. I have a lot more pictures of it. They, they, their desks can raise and lower however they want them. So if the people want to be standing while they're programming, they can stand. Some people like to work that way. Uh, here's a group in South Africa. Now, I was only like seven years old when this picture was taken. Uh, so they can't really be doing mob programming, but it sure looks like they're all working together on the same thing at the same time in the same space. And if you have a scrum master where you work, I think that this guy up here is making sure that they're getting their work done. So that kind of looks like they're doing agile, not just mob programming. Uh, this is uh, Meltwater in Yotabori. I can't say the town names here very well. Is that Can you say that for me, Yotabori? How do you say that? Yotabori. All right. I, I'll mess it up next time. Uh, in Germany, uh, I don't know where this is. I think it might be in Spain. And guess what? In Japan, I was just in Japan about two months ago, and I visited several companies where they're sitting on the floor working this way. Uh, Interesting. Another group in Japan, they're not sitting on the floor. Oh well. And so here we have uh, people doing this remotely. You can do it remotely as well. I'm not going to go into details. I just want to give an introduction for those of you here who've never really seen it or know what it is. You can find a, a video online where, um, I use this to check my time. You can find a video online on YouTube, a couple of them. A video we made in 2012 and another one in 2016 that shows a full day of work condensed to a time lapse of three minutes. So you can see kind of what it looks like. Um, but let's go on. So this, of course, is not, uh, these people aren't programming. But this is a picture of people. I, got, I, I shared a seat next to a person on a flight, and he worked at NASA. So this is NASA, I guess, mission control. And I thought, oh, I can learn about stuff from this guy. And I asked him, um, is there anybody in this room that does not need to be in this room? And he says, nope. You're there only if you're needed for this mission. And I said, why are there so many, uh, like there's two chairs at every station. He said, well, you, there's redundancy. You're going to have two people, because what happens if one person sneezes and, and closes their eyes for a second and misses something important? They're all bringing their own skill to this, their own knowledge. So the, the, the cognitive load of this mission is spread out across a whole bunch of people. And some of them, I've tried to read some of this, payload, uh, payload, deployment, and so on. Well, you're not deploying payload during the entire mission, right? You do that at some specific point. So this is all the people needed are gathered together to do the work they need to do. They're doing it at the same time, the same space. Maybe somebody's working remotely. Let's try this again, because I think that's probably a space shuttle thing. Let's hope it's more pointing that way than that way, but anyways. 
Um, so the, maybe there's a remote worker in there for the day. So whenever I share the story about mob programming and what it, how it worked for us and why we did it, uh, someone will always ask this question. Matter of fact, the second question I was asked, the first question was, what's the right number of team members? Which is sort of a non-question. Uh, I'll cover that in other talks I give. But this is the more popular or the, the more, most common one. It was the second question I was ever asked once I started giving talks about it. Uh, how can you possibly be productive with five people at one computer? And my answer was, I don't know. Uh, does that matter? Because I didn't, know, I didn't know how we could be more productive. We just noticed, because we were paying attention, that we were being more productive. And it wasn't just that we were being more productive. First of all, we noticed when we worked separately and we gathered together the work that we had done separately, we would get a certain amount done. And we worked as a team, we got a whole lot more work done. So what do we do? We just noticed that. We're going to do more of the thing that looks like it's working for us. If we find out it didn't work, we can back out and still work solo. There's always that option. So we have to ask ourselves, is this more work? Were we getting more done? And we kind of felt we were. I actually did some calculations, and we found from the year before we started mob programming into the year we started doing mob programming, we were getting done five to ten times more stuff. More stuff was getting done, but that was only a little bit of a benefit. It, was just, it wasn't just more stuff. We were getting more of the useful stuff done. The more meaningful stuff was getting done. And the other stuff we weren't bothering with. And another thing is we were getting it more, I, I could say we were getting it better done, which means it was more complete, more correct, more the way we wanted it to be at the first uh, stab at it instead of, do you use that saying here in Sweden, at the first stab? That does sound kind of gruesome, doesn't it? Anyways, it was better done. And lastly, it was of much higher quality. These are the things we had noticed. So people would ask that question. I thought, I better be able to answer it. And the first thing I thought was this quote that I got from Russell Acuff. Uh, he talked about systems quite a bit. And the basic idea is that people working separately or as parts of a, separate, uh, of a system doing the work separately and adding the work together doesn't give you the benefits of gathering all this together. You get it by the, 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 the interactions of these parts of the system. That's what systems are about. I like this saying, I think it's not complete, and I'm not going to build on this too much, but there is a great talk by uh, Jessica Kerr where she expands on this idea for mob programming and for other things. She did a keynote at our mob programming conference. We now have a conference in Boston uh, this year, last year, well, this year, and she, uh, she kind of expanded on the idea. So the question as it's being asked is about productivity. And uh, I'm going to share with you a little bit about how I think it should be phrased instead of how can you be productive with five people at one computer. So the first thing I want to do is kind of talk about these three different words because when I first used to talk about this, apparently in Sweden, efficiency and effectiveness, you use the same word for both of those or you don't differentiate between them. And if that's correct, great. If it's not, I'm just a complete fool up here, I guess. So here's the thing. I'm going to explain a little bit of what I, uh, and I usually have a lot more I want to talk about this. But efficiency is about doing things with no motion waste. You know, it's like you want to get things done as quickly as possible. Uh, productivity is getting things done. So it's kind of uh, means we've produced something. And it's a measurement of how much we got done over how much we put into it to get it done. Effectiveness is about getting the right things done. So the reason I'm after effectiveness is that efficiency can just be busy work. You could really be busy working on something that never gets turned into a product or never gets done. I worked on a, pro a project once for um, something like a year and a half that never actually got used by anybody. They finally abandoned it after, um, after a year and a half or actually sometime after I had left. It, they had competitors, and the competitors got to the market sooner than they had, and so they just canceled the project. That's just busy work. Um, productivity can lead to doing the wrong things. What if you got it done and delivered and nobody wanted it? So being productive on the wrong thing isn't particularly useful. So effectiveness is about working on the right thing. So that's where I, I like to start this. I want to change the question. The reason I want to change the question, first of all, I don't think this was the right question. 
and I'll explain a little bit about that in a minute, I wanted this to be a better question. And this is why I share, this is my father. He was probably four maybe or five years old then. And uh, he was a systems engineer, at least that's the way I think of him. He worked for the phone company in the US, uh, designed switches and switching stations and things like that. And uh, he used to say, um, usually the, f the, the question when it's first asked isn't phrased properly. You need to find a better phrasing for that question. So you want a better question. So don't just answer the first question that comes. Of course, in your workplace, you might need to. Don't take that as advice. But he's saying, take that first question and manipulate it a little bit to get to a better question. Uh, this fellow, uh, Peter Block, I love the way that he says this, so I'm going to read it. Transformation comes more from pursuing profound questions than seeking practical answers. And... Uh, T uh, Tim Ottinger says, um, the answer is not in the answers. I like that way of saying it. Kind of what they call it a paradox or something like that. Here's the thing, is that striving to get the answer to the wrong question isn't going to be too helpful. Uh, Deming says, if you don't know how to ask the right question, then you're going to discover nothing. So you've got to figure out how to get a good question. So uh, I started out with this and said, how can we be productive was wrong? I wanted to make it effective. How can we be effective with five people at one computer? And then to channel my father again, he would say, you've got to take that original question and flip it over. You ask it from the opposite point of view. So the point of view of the person asking, how can you be effective with five people at one computer is thinking, we're only getting one thing done instead of five things done. That doesn't quite make sense uh, to me necessarily, but that's the point of view of that. So let's, what's the opposite point of view? So if we're going to flip this over, this is how I think if we're going to flip it over, I want a better a reverse question. If we had a lot of time, I'd ask for uh, everybody maybe to do this as a workshop. I'm going to check my time. I think we're doing okay. So tell me, what would be a question from the opposite point of view? Somebody who's bold enough to speak out loud in a crowd like this, what would be a, a question from the opposite point of view? What makes us more efficient about being alone? That's not exactly, the, that, that's sort of correct. So I want to get it a little further towards about being, working as a group, but that's a good point. Ah, so I still want to go to the very opposite. So this is, won't we lose the effectiveness of four people? That's still kind of the same question. I want to get it the, from the opposite point of view. What do you do when you get stuck working alone and... Ah, so about the goal. So I think we're real, getting real close. This is the question that I came up with. How can we be effective when we separate people that should be working together? That's the opposite point of view. So which one actually works? Does... does Separating them work better or just working together? Who's proved one or the other? I don't think anybody's gone out before we started mob programming. I don't, I don't think people were doing studies to decide whether they should work as a group or not. They were just kind of always separating the work up so individuals could do it. It seems natural. It seems like the right way. But what usually happens when we separate people that should be working together, we put barriers between them. So it's harder and harder for them to communicate with each other. So this led to a better question. Because my dad was, his technique was to say, you ask it from the opposite point of view so that you can decide what do we need to know to be able to determine which is the better way to work or whatever the question ha happens to be. So uh, I came up with this question. I don't know if it's a lot better question, but it would allow us to evaluate two different ways of working and say, does this one work better or does that one work better? So we can ask, what are the things that destroy productivity? And I normally do this as an exercise, but with this constraint of time we have and this many people, we won't. But I did this in one of my workshops with 20 people, a three-minute exercise. We came up with 50 independent sticky notes, all with a slightly different reason on them. I put them into this uh, kind of columns, and you can see... This was tw uh, three minutes of work by 20 people, came up with 50 different, and they're enough different that I kept, you know, the only the ones that seem unique. Uh, there's a couple that I really, I think are really common. Uh, waiting on clarification is one. 
I've got a question. I can't get it answered. I need to get that answered. Dependency on other teams. Uh, unrealistic expectations. Distractions. Uh, too much noise. Too quiet. Kind of a, you know, one person thinks it should be noisier. Workflow inter uh, interruptions. On and on and on. So now we can say, do we have those problems in this style of work? And do we have those problems in that style of work? Here is what we noticed. We were paying attention. We were really watching to see about these things. I bucketed or I put these into various categories, bucketed them into categories. And what we noticed was when we worked together, many of those problems simply faded away. They just didn't exist for us anymore. We didn't set out to solve for those problems. We never set out to solve for any problem. What we were solving, uh, uh, we were set out to do was turn up the good on working well together. So basically, oh, I've got to show you this again because you, you, you completely skip over it when I'm giving my talk. These problems faded away when we started working as a team. Isn't that brilliant, the way that works? It took me like two hours to put that animation together. So if I don't point it out, nobody even appreciates how hard I worked. So I'm going to share one of these kinds of problems, one of the many communication problems that we have. And I call this the question queue time. Uh, the question queue time is the amount of time that we must wait to get an answer to a question that is blocking us. It's stopping us from getting our work done, and until we get the answer, we can't continue on. We can use a value stream map to, to look at this, and here the green, the high upper bar is green, represents work getting done, and then we get a little blue line, that represents we have a question we can't get answered, and then we have this red bar that shows us the waiting time to get the answer. Now there's usually other work we have to explain it to someone, put it into an email and send it off, or in Slack or whatever you use. And there's a lot of uh, maybe some ramping up and, and, and uh, maybe context switching and things like that going on. To make this easy to demonstrate, what if we just agreed that for every hour we work, we get a blocking question? We can't answer it ourselves, so we have to go to someone else to get the answer. So, to me, if we, if we look at this logically, and we could always get our, logically is I think the right term, if we could always get our answers immediately, as soon as we have a question, we get the answer immediately, we would always have the green bar. If it takes us two minutes, we're going to have these little dings in there throughout the day. We'll lose about uh, 16 minutes in the day. But what if it takes us 10 minutes to get the answer? And that's really rapid. Most people I've talked to say it takes at least an hour. What if it took an hour? Now we're wasting half the day. And we usually get more than one or two or three or four blocking questions in a day. And when I take a poll in my workshops and stuff, we frequently see, yeah, that's a good animation. We frequently see that it takes a day to get the answer, and sometimes two or three days. So what do we do about this? That's sort of the question is, um, there we go, how do we typically solve for this? Somebody here can tell me. What do you usually do? You got a task that you're working on, should have gone back to here, what do we do? We start something new, we work on something else while we're waiting. I read in a management book, they said, always have something of less importance for them to work on while they're waiting to get the answers to the question. What we've basically done is introduced something that's called inventory. Queuing is a waste, and inventory is a waste. We've introduced a waste to solve for our perceived problem, which is really just a symptom. So basically, if you write, make the slides and they match up nicely, you get this. A nice green bar all the time, but you also have a red bar, and it's being hidden by the green bar. What we've done is we've solved for the symptoms of the queuing and not for the problem of not getting the answers directly. Okay, so inventory is work that we started on and haven't yet delivered. Nobody's using it. Uh, I ask every t everywhere I go or I try to, I ask, um, how do you measure inventory of software in your company? And nobody yet has told me how they do it, that they can do it. They most of the time haven't even thought of this. It's work, stuff that we've done that isn't delivered and making money for us or serving the purpose of our company somehow. So let's not solve you know, a, a symptom of a problem by introducing another problem. That will never work. It's like with me, uh, I come to these workshops, I go all over the world now and go to these workshops, and they always want to serve me something I shouldn't eat. And yesterday I had like a whole bar of candy. 
That's kind of traditional here, I think. And I'm really tempted. So is there a way for me to eat that candy in a way that it won't allow me to gain weight? So what happens to me is, you've heard the thing garbage in, garbage out when you talk about data and reporting. For me, it's garbage in and garbage stays. It stays, and at the end of a trip, I weigh like 10 pounds more than when I started. And so there's nothing I can do to the candy, uh, with the candy, that will make that not happen. I could eat it slowly, or I could swallow it whole, or eat a candy and then a carrot, and then a candy and then a carrot. None of that's gonna help. The only thing that's really gonna help is to solve the real problem is don't eat the candy. There is some value in eating the candy. It's pleasurable and, and it gives you a little energy, I guess, but you get the picture, right? So how did we solve for this? This is a trick question. We didn't solve for it, I already told you. It just naturally happened for us when we started working together. This led us to the rest of this talk. One thing we noticed was our biggest problem, so on the team itself, when we were an individual like this, and it's just the, the, the people who are actually creating the software physically, then whenever we'd have a question, let's say that the team lead or some of the database expert could answer, they're already there to answer it, and often we don't even need to ask the question. They just answer it because they're in the same context as us. They have no context switching, and we have no context switching. If we went to the database expert and they're working in a different team, you know how they often do, and go over there and talk to them, we have to explain to them our problem or what we need to do and get them to understand it. That means we were pulling that out of their context, the work they were already doing, and getting them to work on our work. And so we're breaking up their concentration and destroying their flow to solve our problem. So when we all worked together, we didn't have anything blocking us except for when the product owners couldn't respond. So this is something we did kind of have to work on. This particular product owner, was a, he was a manager in another department, and his, the software that he was asking us to make, he would be enough of an expert on it to act as the product owner. But he had to go do his other job. You know, he couldn't just sit with us all day. So one day we didn't deliver something for him. We were trying to do daily deliveries. And he said, um, why didn't you deliver? And I said, well, first of all, I didn't need to answer the question, and I just said to him, I don't think you need to ask that question. You know why we didn't deliver. And he said, yeah, I, you sent me some emails and some messages, and I couldn't respond because I was in meetings all day. And I said, yeah, well, that's why we couldn't deliver. He said, if I would have got back to you quickly, could have you got this done? And again, I, I, I don't think I need to answer that question for you. You know the answer already. And he said, okay, so from now on, anytime you have a question for me, you send me a note, I will respond within two minutes. And if I have to come over here, I'll come over here. So when he'd go into a meeting, he'd tell them, hey, I've got this hot project I'm working on. I may need to leave at any moment. So he dedicated himself to that, and we got his work done really quickly. And he explained this in our meetings we would have with the other product owners in the company, and they all start realizing if they contribute really rapidly, they'll get their work done. And so we would normally ask them to come and sit with us an hour or two at least every day. Okay, so this is what we ended up with, and this is about the time, a year after we started, where we noticed and called this that we now have a one-piece flow. We call this an automatic one-piece flow. As a team, we're now only working on one thing at a time. We take a story down to work on it. We read it to ourselves. The product owner there is there. We decide what it is. We set, aside, uh, uh, set it down and start working on it. And within two, three hours, we got it done. What we were noticing was stories that used to take when we were working separately used to take two weeks or a week or two to get done. We're now getting done in two or three hours. So we're getting two or three stories done a day sometimes, maybe even more. This was a very effective way of working. Well, that one piece flow, and you'll see this next very dynamic animation, became really important to me. I'll show that again. I know you want to see that. Wow. So that's really the impact I'm trying to get out of these slides. So this got me thinking about, it. this is maybe how I can explain this. If I can understand flow, maybe I can explain why, how it is we can be effective with five people at one computer. So I started studying flow. And what I found was there were at least two kinds of flow, and now I kind of see there as being three kinds of flow. And I thought maybe they interfere with each other, and I wanted to learn as much about them as possible. And the first kind is psychological flow, which can be done at an individual level or at a team level, and lean flow, as in lean manufacturing. So I'm going to explain about that now. Mihai Chiksen Mihai. Chiksen Mihai. I'm not sure how to say his name. Is anyone here have that same last name? 
because I'd like to have somebody tell me how to say his name. He did studies in the 70s and 80s, and he's still doing studies about this concept of flow that he identified and named. The basic idea of one of the explanations I've heard is this. You're so involved in what you're doing that you are not or you don't feel separate from the work you're doing. You're so focused on what you're doing and you're so involved in it, you're part of it, you're one with it. There's a whole bunch of, these are some of the features of it, some of the nature of it, I won't read them down. You know, you can, you can look up flow in, on the internet, no problem. It's also known as being in the zone. So when you're really focused on your work, the sense of time disappears, you forget about yourself, you're paying attention to what you're doing, your brain becomes very activated. Now, I'm not explaining it well, and I've had a couple psychologists try to explain it to me. Uh, I wasn't like laying on a couch at the moment, but they tried to explain it to me, and I think I'm starting to understand it. But this is a kind of flow that I was afraid that us working as a team, we would be breaking this flow. Can you get flow as a team? And as I started studying about it, I started looking for team activities. And here's an example. I don't think these people are programming, but they're all working on the same problem at the same time. And I really like how focused that person is. I think that person's really focused in the work, trying to understand. That's like my very first calculator I had. Yeah. There's another, this is a good example of a team doing something together in flow. When you hire a band for your wedding, you don't go, you know, I really can't afford to pay everybody for the whole time, so if each one of you could come in for 20 minutes and play for just 20 minutes and then we'll have a band, but one at a time, it ain't gonna work, okay? Uh, I'm not sure what I'm trying to show here exactly, but I think these people are thinking together. This is uh, Xerox Park. So I'm not sure which people specifically are in there, but a lot of the stuff they did, the work of, um, uh, the folks that were there at the time they were there kind of was uh, led to almost everything we see in a modern computer. Interesting stuff. And one last one I'll show you is this. If you need to have an operation, do you go to the doctor and say, you know, I know I need to get my kidneys removed. Don't actually do that. Um, but I don't want to pay for all those people. Can you just, could I just have the surgeon and not all the rest? Would you want to be operated on by that doctor? I would hope not, because they need all those people, even though they're not all very active during this whole process. So this, these people are very focused on the work they're doing. I got to sit next to a doctor on a flight and ask him, you see on television, the doctor goes, scalpel, and the nurse or whatever say scalpel, and then they'll do the thing, and suture or whatever, sponge, you know? And he said, no, we don't do that, because the team knows what I need. When I put my hand out, they put in my hand exactly what I need in exactly the way I need to have it. They're in flow together. They're all paying attention, not necessarily, th that's a very focused attention compared to what we do when we work as a team doing uh, programming. So this is a book or a paper you can get. I think this fellow's from the Netherlands, and you can find this on a line as a PDF. At least I think you still can. And um, he explains how you can have flow in a team. And so this was part of my research, trying to figure out, I'm, I'm not a researcher, I'm not a scientist, I'm just trying to explain or learn how to explain this idea of how could this possibly work. So this is all good, right? So we can have team flow, we can have individual flow. And when we work as a team, we get the individual flow because each person is in charge of their own brain. If they feel they want to go and sit alone and work alone, they can. If they can do their own thinking while they're sitting with the group, they can do that because we all can think in a group. Uh, if you feel like you want to go take a walk or you feel it's time to take a nap, you can go do whatever you need to do. You just have to be generally available to the team when you're not there so they can call you back if they have a question. So you can keep your own flow if you need it. You can go and try some stuff out at your own desk. It doesn't matter. We also get in the team flow because this interaction between the individuals when we're sharing the cognitive load really starts building. It's like some people compare it to a jazz band or something, how we play off of each other when we're playing music that way together. So anyways, there's another kind of flow. And this is the flow in lean manufacturing. And it, it's a difficult thing. I, I think the terms are the same, but they mean really different things. These are two kinds of flows. And so I think that flow uh, is maybe these are... They're not contradictory, they have some things in common, but I'm gonna give a very simple description of what lean uh, flow in lean manufacturing is. 
in, in manufacturing, uh, you're going to basically do the complete production of a piece from start to finish with as little waiting or inventory as possible. Well, that's exactly what we were doing, but we were doing it with software. We were going from beginning to end on any one story with as little waiting, as little inventory as possible. If we started on something, we would finish it within a few hours. And if we didn't finish it within a few hours because we got interrupted, if somebody came in and said, hey, there's an emergency, some bug in some important software, you need to work on it right now, we would usually ask them, can you wait an hour or two? Because we'll be done with this. And if they could, then we really still have the one piece flow. But if they really must have it done right then, we would set our work aside, take on their work, get it done in an hour or two or three, hand it back to them, or figuratively speaking, and then we'd pick up our original work. And what we found was we could get right back on our original work with almost no uh, uh, ramping up time to get back to it. Because we'd have just set it down, we'd working on it just a few hours ago, and we have enough uh, shared memory on the team that some, someone will say, oh yeah, I know what we need to do, and then someone else you know, will say, oh yeah, that's right, let's move on with that. And then we're there, we're working. Uh, this has been written about in a book called The Principles of Product Development Flow. So, uh, by a guy named Reinertsen. And I've read this book three times. Has anybody read this book? Let's see if it, has anybody read this book? Oh my, so this is, I would recommend somebody here get the book and tell everyone else what it was about. Uh, I've read it three times and I still have trouble with it. But it's very clear, very simple explanations of different kinds of uh, what flow is and different ways of damaging flow. And he has a whole chapter on queuing. So I really focused on the queuing chapter. So I recommend that book pretty highly. Um, they don't give me a kickback or anything, but I should talk to them about that. So if we use a value stream map, basically we can do the same thing as before, except for we're just going to talk about what is the stuff we should be working on, the green part is we're getting the right work done. And that right work in software development is partly is the discovery process. The discovery process is we do some work and whatever we learned will guide us through the next step. We might have t started some work and go, hey, this isn't going to do it. And we reverse back out and try something else. If we could do it within just a few hours, then we can make try a lot of experience, experiments and get there really quickly instead of trying things and having to get approvals and so on and so on. Uh, the red is the stuff, it's the wrong things, the stuff we shouldn't be doing. And this is just some examples. Um, uh, waiting, merging, arguing, discussing rather than trying things. I've seen this with teams when I'm, when I'm uh, coaching. They will sit and talk, they've written a little code, and they're going, well, I don't think that's going to work. And uh, in the back of my mind, I'm going, you already wrote a test for it. You could just hit the button to run, and you'll see whether it works or not but they'll sit and discuss whether it'll work or not for 10 or 15 minutes, when all you have to do is hit that button. And that's a very drastic example of this. But I often see that. People will discuss an idea rather than just trying it. And you could try two ideas in the time it takes you to discuss one idea. So why not just try them and see? And try them both, hopefully. Um, doing the wrong thing, failure demand. That means doing things because uh, you, your process isn't working so good for you, so you've got to do them over again and over again. That's not the same thing as refactoring. Prior, prioritizing, coordination, estimating, that all comes in the same. Meetings all comes under this same thing. Okay, so I'm going to give you my definition of software development flow. I'll just read it since it's already up there. Uh, each story flows from idea to delivered working software. That means somebody's actually using it directly as possible, without any of those wastes of waiting or inventory, distractions or interruptions. This flow allows us to really be effective in doing our work. So if you see this in regular cycle, you'll see I'm doing this because every talk that has anything to do with Agile is going to have a circle in it somewhere. And this is the thing. We go from the idea to a story to write some code, uh, get it delivered, and, and see what the users think about it. But where in this cycle do we get to learn stuff? All the time. This is a learning cycle. And learning is what, the, what this is all about. Our main product is usually learning. So we can get to the thing that we actually need to deliver to someone. So what do we uh, optimize for with mob programming? We optimize for the flow of the work rather than the output of the individual. 
If we do mob programming the way I like to see it being done, we work in a very sustainable and relaxed manner. We're not feeling under pressure. We're not feeling like we have to understand everything because we're sharing the cognitive load. I don't know if that's really the right word, but it sounds good. Cognitive load across five or six people. So I don't have to know everything about everything when I'm working alone, like I do when I'm working alone. I found this. When I worked alone, the very best of me and the worst of me got into everything I did. And then when I learned about pair programming, and by 2002 or so, I had started really doing a lot of it or trying to, I would notice the best of me and the best of my pair would get into everything I did, and the worst of me or the other person would not get into the work that I did. We would not get our worst because we always elevated each other as we were doing our work. So we're not trying to get the most work out of each person on the team, which is what I think we try to do when we separate people to work. We want them to focus on their specialty. We're not trying to get the most out of each person. We're trying to get the best of each person into everything we do. It's a more relaxed way of work, in my opinion. You come, my, my wife would even say when I would get home, she's the artist, she did all the, most of all the artwork in my talks. Uh, she would say, boy, it used to be you'd come home, you'd be grumpy, and now you come home and, and you're happy. It's like she didn't say, and you're dopey. She didn't say that, because it's kind of, there's seven dwarves, I think I'm at least two of the dwarves. And so, uh, this is sort of the thing. I, I had more fun in my life. I had more enjoyment in my life. It was much more relaxed when I worked on this team. So, you know, it's probably coming up to near, we're getting, you're going to need to show me the time. Okay, so I usually am not paying attention to that. I should have mentioned earlier. When you see him showing that out loud, let me know that it's time for me to end, okay? Because I will forget and I go on and on. That's why I use slides, by the way, because it keeps me from going on too long on each one. I just keep going through them. Dan O'Reilly says this, cues are the root cause of the majority of waste in product development. I talked to some folks at a huge chip manufacturing firm, and they did studies in their work, and they said in their development work, not just software, but developing new technology, it was something like 98% of their waste was from waiting. They kept records to see where was the waste coming in. They did value stream maps and everything. I didn't guide them through it. They heard me give this talk, and they came up and explained to me what they discovered. Boy, if that's that much waiting, all we have to do is start cutting a little bit of that waiting out, and we're going to get a, a big gain. We got rid of all of that waiting. We just don't wait for things. So this is why I believe I can now answer that question, that at first I say, I don't know. But remember, this is like, I know that it's working, so I'm looking for data that proves I'm correct. That's probably not the best way to go, so I've also read other things that could show me where maybe I'm wrong. This isn't for everyone, by the way. Not everybody can work well with a group. Uh, not everybody thinks that way to, to be able to do that, but a lot of people can. So I believe that we get the effectiveness with five people working together because of flow plus flow. These two kinds of flows, we get them both. But really, because now you saw, it's flow plus flow plus flow. So what should we call it? Flow plus plus. <laughs> Somebody in one of the audience shouted that out before I'd, I ever thought of it, and I thought, hey, I like that. It's, like, it's not unique, but I, I can use that paradigm. So we're getting the individual flow because the individuals are in control of their own brain. They get to think with the group or not, depending on what they feel they need to do that day. And usually at, at Hunter, where we kind of originated the idea, we found that people wanted to mostly work with the team, but there were several who would go off and think alone every now and then, a couple times a day usually, and come back and say, oh, I have an idea now. So that was, that's part of it. Actually, uh, I will sh uh, let me ask this question. Um, when do your best ideas come to you? On the bus home. This is a great, so what's another one? At night. When you're showering, that's the most common one I hear. I think there's some sensory deprivation environment in the shower maybe. What else? When you're sleeping, I'll wake up sometimes at 2 or 3 in the night and, and I'll have an idea that I just go ahead and write them down. And I used to think it's just nonsense, but actually my brain has just offloaded a bunch of nonsense, I think, and it's now got the pure thought that I needed. Now some people will say, so showering is the most common and just before I go to bed, 
just after I wake up and during the night is what is, is a really another common grouping. Any more? At work. Yeah, your best ideas come to you at work. I like that. Have you ever had your manager come in and say, we really need to get this done? Go get a shower. <laughs> like, I'd like to see a place where they just install showers all the way around. I think that would be an advanced experiment to try, but I think we should try it. So this is a thing. I don't know when the best ideas are going to come to an individual. They get their own pattern. Um, so I think we still have a few minutes left. So there's five minutes left. Uh, I, uh, my wife and I, we worked together, in a, we owned a graphics and signage company, and we were working on a very difficult project all day long. And at the end of the day, we still hadn't come up with a solution for some design problem. And we come back in the next morning, and oh, I know what to do, and we're doing it. So all of a sudden, the idea came to us as soon as we came in the next morning because we'd offloaded it. So my wife, after we did that like five times, she said, why don't we do an experiment? Just spend an hour looking at the project and then set it aside and see what we think about it in the morning. And sure enough, the next morning, we would have the solution. We were wasting the whole day, but because she's sort of inquisitive that way too, we found a way to not waste all that time. Ingest the problem for a while, let it settle in, and then go on with the work. So I can't tell people how they should think. That's up to them. We are enabling the team flow by having everybody together and keeping them together. We work together. We come in at about the same time every day, take lunch at about the same time every day, and go off uh, home at the same time every day. Now, not everybody can arrange their schedules that way, but as long as you get a good chunk of time to work together, you can get good at working together, and that's what I'm hoping we can do. And then we're enabling... Uh, this team or this um, lean flow, and that gets rid of that question queue time, which I think was our biggest weight. The queuing was the biggest waste that we had. So again, you get to see this marvelous uh, animation one more time. A lot of those problems just faded away for us. This is why I think we can work effectively with five people at one computer. We were getting more done, but not just more done. And I want to say it a slightly different way. We were learning a lot. We were also getting the higher quality, and we were having fun. So we noticed that from the very first day we started doing this, and it was purely by accident that we started doing it. So I'm going to leave you with this uh, last two slides. The object isn't to create art. It's to be in that wonderful state that makes art inevitable. If we sit down to really crank out software, it's not as good as creating an environment where cranking out software is just easy to do. Let's make it easy to be ex excellent at our job. And the last thing is, uh, I think, uh, there is no magic and it's all magic. So that's it, and then you get to see this picture of me, I'll try and pose just like that for you. They took this a year ago at another conference and I thought, that actually makes me look like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so I'm gonna use that picture. Thank you very, very much. we have time to do that. Oh, we have five minutes, so I should ramble on aimlessly for a while longer. Is there any questions? Yes. You can make this work remotely. So uh, the team, so I start, we started doing remote working at, at Hunter when somebody, uh, their, their spouse was going to have a child. So you can guess whether it was a male or a female worker. Their spouse was going to have a child, so they wanted to work from home for a while. And so um, we set up to do it remotely that, with just one person remotely. And then I worked in another company after I left Hunter uh, where we did this three hours a day. And all you need to have is a way to share your screen and to share communicating with each other verbally. And usually we'd have the pictures, so something like, you know, a tool like Zoom or whatever uh, works good enough. There, the tools are getting much, much better for doing shared keyboard. So you need to get a slightly different protocol, but it certainly can be done. And you saw the picture uh, that was Corgi Bytes in uh, uh, Richmond, Virginia. They have people in New York City and other areas, and they all work. But if you're in different time zones, that's the main problem. But, that, that, but otherwise, it, it can be done pretty straightforward. And maybe one more question we have time for? Two more questions, two short questions. Yes. Yeah, 
Okay, so uh, you can't. So, so the question is sort of like when we are working as a team, maybe we don't need so many managers. What we found, and my goal when I came onto this company, they hired me to work with this team, and my goal was to make it where they didn't need a manager. I didn't know we would end up doing mob programming. So b when I left, I left because I knew they didn't need me anymore. Here's the thing, no manager is gonna say, yeah, hi, let's start doing this so they don't need me anymore. So that's, I, I don't know how to convince somebody, you need to, you need to quit, and maybe you need to retire 20 years early or something like that, I don't know. I, I, I think that we need to figure this out in our industry. Uh, what we found there at Hunter that we now have, I think they have eight or nine teams, and there's one manager for those 40 people or whatever it is. Because it's like when you're, when you're managing 40 individuals, then you have to put a certain amount of time into each one, but when you're managing those 40 individuals on eight or nine teams, you can deal with each team as if it was an individual. You don't need as much management overload. Most of what we do for management in software and everything else is simply making it hard for us uh, to get good work done. Let's figure that out. Let's solve that problem. That's why I said early on, software development, we don't need to control it, we need to liberate it. Let's get liberated so that everybody can excel in their work and in their life and not make it where they're just, it's a pain to go to work. And they're just always, oh, what am I gonna, what are they gonna yell at me uh, today about? I don't wanna get yelled at about anything, but uh, yeah. So maybe we're done. Any more, there was one more question? What, what, well, go ahead, yeah. We have a mic deck back there. Um, so you said that more, more programming is to bring the best of people to software development. But then I've worked with lots of people who think they're the best at what they do. Yes. So then they tend to like dominate the conversation. Sure. So then how would you deal with that? Well, so when we bring all the knowledge we need, if it's one person and they have all the knowledge about it, then what they don't really, we don't need the rest of the team. They could just do that work and get it all done. So this is about doing work that takes more than one person. But we need to up our skills of working together. So if I'm a dominant person in this team, I really have to pay attention and become more uh, laid back and let the others do. One of the first things I hope people learn when I'm giving my trainings is we need to just try other people's ideas. Be, be willing to just try other people's ideas. Listen to them. And we do little exercises in listening. So this is something that takes time. You just don't, um, we've all spent our whole career learning how to work alone. So now we have to unlearn that. We've really set things up so we're always working alone, and we have to work alone. We need to find a way to get around that. So, yeah, some people might be a little bit more dominant, but they can learn to work with a team. And the reverse is true for people who are maybe always quiet. We need their contribution as well. Google did a whole study of their teams. It's called Project Aristotle, where they studied the best teams. What made the best teams so good? And they started figuring out that part of it was equal voice and psychological safety. We value each voice on the team. That doesn't mean they all speak an equal amount, but that each voice has an equal say and uh, everybody's safe to speak. So we have to build skills to be able to do that. We don't automatically do that. It's not easy. There's nothing easy about doing this, but once you get good at it, it your, job, your work becomes easy. Good enough, right? All right, so thank you again. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>